No Thank you for joining us to the C2C Quick Wins on Securing Your Remote Workforce. And welcome to the Chamber to Community Back to Business NWA series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Karen Wagaman, Vice President for Downtown Development with the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. This new virtual series was created as a response to requests from member businesses seeking tools and tactics to help navigate through the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I would like to thank our community builder sponsors who are making this free series possible, Cox Communications and Black Hills Energy. And of course, we want to thank Adapio Technology for providing the program. Today's subject matter experts are Angel Button and Cheryl Hearn. And I'll tell you a little bit about our presenters. Angel Button is a senior cybersecurity consultant at Adapio Technology Partners. Angel has won an award from her peers as a breakthrough female in cybersecurity. She is passionate about collaboration with her team and with her clients and focuses on teaching, investigating, and implementing security solutions to protect businesses and individuals. Angel and her family enjoy Arkansas parks and trails, theater and festivals, and her miniature schnauzer, Professor Snape, has quite a following on Instagram. Cheryl Hearn is a cybersecurity enthusiast and senior consultant with Adafio Technology Partners. A constant learner, she has numerous IT certifications and is committed to protecting her clients' digital assets and wide-ranging experience in information technology and cybersecurity. Cheryl shares her passion around data privacy with family members and friends and anyone who will listen without their eyes glazing over. She indulges the creative side of her brain through photography, playing guitar, and traveling as much as possible. So we want to thank all of you for joining us, and we will turn this over to Angel and Cheryl for our program. Thanks so much, Karen, and thank you to the Chamber for having us. I know that Angel and I are both super passionate about cybersecurity, so getting to, you know, just share some of our tips and tricks is a great opportunity for us personally as well, you know, for Adopio. So thank you for that. Let me get our slide deck going here. So a little bit about Adopio, um, something that sets Adopio apart as a um, technology solutions um, firm is just the, our commitment to our client success and our core values and having that dedication to humility and integrity um, and making sure that we're protecting our clients whenever possible. So we have a large Arkansas presence here and um, it's just a, it's been a great organization to be able to work with. So we talked about me a little bit. So I, maybe one point outside of what Karen covered there is just um, I've grown up in Arkansas pretty much my whole life and I have a degree in writing. So just goes to show you that cybersecurity people don't have to be completely technical to figure out how to add and make some sort of contribution there, so. Um, I'm Angeline Button, uh, aka Angel Button. That's what I generally turn to really quick if somebody calls me. Uh, thank you for kind of going over my bio. I'm trying to think of something interesting. I am a recent grandmother, actually. Two months ago, I became a grandmother and I'm loving every minute of it. Uh, even during COVID. So we, we figured out how to work around that for now, which has kind of been enjoyable, a little more family time than we normally would get. So that's a little bit about me. Looking forward to this presentation. So today for our agenda, we're going to talk about a lot of different elements, um, technical things that you can do, process type uh, solutions that you can look towards for getting those cybersecurity wins. Uh, we're going to talk about multi-factor authentication, patching software, how we can protect our passwords and our accounts, uh, the antivirus type solutions that we want to use to protect our systems, um, network security options, and protecting our email, and taking a look at some things that we can do there as individuals, and some other technical elements, and then also a really a key point around cybersecurity insurance, and so to kind of think about um, having some contingencies in place in case something does happen. So. so the first question we have is how can we improve our employees cyber risk while working remotely? So we know that the, the pandemic situation that we're in today has shifted a lot of our workforce and has created a digital transformation 
on how we are approaching um, employee access into our environments. And so there's some things that we want to cover for you to think about that your employees can think about uh, in order to protect the organization itself while they're working from home and protecting their health through this process. So multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, MFA or 2FA, these are terms that are becoming more and more popular and it's because they're very important when it comes to cyber protection, not only on a personal level, but also for our businesses. Um, so we see that enabling multi-factor can ensure your accounts are up to 99.9% .9 less likely to be compromised. The reason for that is that there's a lot of bad actors out there taking advantage of the fact that we as businesses and um, you know, users of technology um, are, have these things a part of our life, have these things a part of our work lives, and we need to be able to access those oftentimes for our phones or while we're on the go uh, so that we can keep up with all the things that we need to. And so um, as technology becomes a bigger part of our life, we have to consider how we continue to up the security controls that are in place. So it's not the traditional controls um, that are enough anymore. And so we've got to add in additional layers of protection as we go. So multi-factor authentication is uh, the type of scenario where you go and put your username and your password into the website of your bank account. And a code gets sent to your email address, or maybe it sends a text message to you, or maybe you even have an app on your phone that says, hey, is this you? Do you approve this activity or not? And so the reason for that is anything that we have that's accessible for the internet is um, if you can get to it from the internet, then a bad actor can get to it from the internet. And so having this additional um, factor in place that's outside of your username and password um, requires you to have something in your hand, right? It's something you have, not just something that you know, such as your credentials. And so this becomes a really important element in protecting that unauthorized access from your bank account, from your work email account, from, um, you know, even your Facebook account. There's lots of different um, opportunities there that we have to start thinking about protecting. Another win um, that helps us protect our organization by protecting our home devices is uh, software updates. So I know me, before I came into um, cybersecurity and that sort of focus, didn't think a whole lot about the importance of making sure that I updated my own device, my own laptop, um, even my own network router. It's not something that necessarily was a part of my normal uh, clean house process. So um, vulnerabilities come open all the time on the same types of routers that you buy at Best Buy, just like they um, happen to appear for the more commercial type devices that we see um, at the organizational level. And so patching those devices helps us ensure that we're, we're making, we're putting um, some protections in place for the vulnerabilities that are continually being discovered and oftentimes being exploited by the bad guys, essentially. So another thing to help protect our personal devices there is there's lots of unnecessary software that comes with a system. We call it bloatware. Um, for instance, when I install a new version of Windows um, on my computer, there is a piece of software called Xbox Live. And I know Angel is a big gamer. I'm not as much a big gamer, so that's not something that I need on my system personally. So that's one of the things that we want you to be mindful about removing it. It's one less thing that you have to patch if you think about it. So just to kind of help create some more security controls there. From a work perspective, um, patching is also equally important there. Um, one approach that we often recommend to organizations, if they have the option to have a standard image, so let's say that it's a normal process for me to um, get a new laptop for an employee and to have a Windows 10 device. Um, having a standard image where I've already gone through and I've thought about this for the employee. I've removed that Xbox Live. I've secured a lot of other things. That image is something that can help me make sure that I'm putting a secure device on my network each and every time. It's, it's hard to remember a lot of the things that you need to do before you put a network, a device on the network. 
Um, so having an image or alternatively, if you don't have that process in place today, having a checklist that you go through and you walk through, okay, did I remove Xbox Live? Did I remove some other things that I need to think about for that system? And then um, one other big key thing there is that there's so much patching that happens. So if you think about all the applications you have on your personal device and your, your um, the applications, the browsers, all of those things, there's a lot to keep up with and there's even more to keep up with at the organizational level. So um, being able to automate those processes as much as possible is going to be key in protecting um, that work environment. So the next thing that we think about protecting um, our work environment, our home environment, our bank accounts, our social media accounts, anything that can kind of be really important to us. Let's say it's even our um, a website where we upload all of our photos so that we have that uh, cloud backup. Um, we want to make sure that we're using passwords, passphrases that are going to help secure that access as much as possible so that nothing bad happens. Um, so Traditionally, you know, we talked about having all these different characters and numbers and, and things like that. And we know that, that that's a security control that worked, you know, quite some time ago, but now we're in this phase and things are evolving. And so we kind of have to evolve with it and think about how do we get more secure passwords um, in conjunction with things like multi-factor authentication. So um, having a phrase that you can remember pretty easily that has spaces in it, that has punctuations, that you can put numbers in it, like I love NFL football, um, that's going to make it easier for you to remember those types of things. And that's usually the challenge that we have with passwords, right, is just remembering them. We have a password for everything. We have all of our work accounts that we have passwords for. We have all of our home accounts that we have passwords for. And it's just, there's a lot of challenge in that. And so that's where we also get into um, password managers and how important they are um, for both work and personal um, because the moment there are some things that you don't have control of from a password perspective. For instance, when I create an account with LinkedIn or with any type of third party service, that password is stored in their environment under their protection. And it's possible, and as we've seen in the news, that those passwords get breached and there's a big database database breach and you know maybe you find out maybe you have some monitoring in place and you find out that that password has been compromised well where are you using that password are you using it on your work account are you using it for um, multiple accounts do you have the same password for facebook that you do for um, your bank account those are things that attackers are able to think about right they do their research they get your account information here and then they go and see what else they can find out about you to take advantage of that opportunity. So having a password manager to help create a unique password for every single account. I know that sounds really challenging, but that's what password managers are for. Um, having that unique password for every single account is going to make sure that the impact of that type of breach, like a LinkedIn database breach, doesn't affect every single one of the accounts that you're using because you're relying on that password manager to have that uniqueness and protect you as far as you know multiple accounts go. So default accounts are a really important factor, especially in our home network. So again, this is something that it's it's not something we traditionally think about. We go and we buy a new computer at Best Buy and we turn it on and it has a lot of the things that we need and we're excited to use it for our own purposes. Um, but something that we don't always think about is that there are default accounts that come with that new laptop that we've installed or let's say we're having a new router installed or even maybe our ISP is sending us, uh, internet service provider is sending us um, a router to put in our home. Well, we need to, to look onto that device and, and figure out, do we have any accounts there that are default? So I know like a Windows 10 device, it's going to have a guest account and it's a default account. So it has a default, a password that attackers often try to use to get inside of an environment. And so you might think that that might be something that's more of like a user issue, uh, home personal network. I, maybe I forget to do that, but that doesn't happen in our organization. But Angel and I know that we both see this all the time in environments where there are default accounts in devices in our 
work networks, and those create a lot of risk to the organization because the attackers, the bad actors, they're going to go out there and, and test those things and just to see how far they can get with that type of activity. So it's really important to disable those accounts. Um, so there's lots of resources on the internet that can help you figure out from like a Windows device or, you know, a Mac device and how to, how to go in and, and get rid of that type of account. Um, when it comes to your routers, there's a lot of different options there. Again, that did the internet service provider provide you the device or did you buy it from a place like Best Buy or Amazon? Um, but either way, the, the vendors are always going to have some options there on how to, to walk you through that process. So that's something that warrants a little bit of research and, or, you know, you're like me and Angel and we know that our families typically reach out to us to say, hey, I don't know what to do with this, you know, can you help me? So find the, find that IT person in your life and they can definitely walk you through that person process. Next up is antivirus. So we do as much as we can. We try and fix our accounts. We try to make sure we're patching our systems, but no matter what things happen. So that's why we think about security and layers. Uh, so that's what antivirus is really for, something that's gotten past all of those processes and controls that we're trying to protect. And so this is just another control to help maybe pick up some of that um, malicious activity. So the, the key thing that with antivirus is not always what antivirus solution that you're using, because a lot of them are going to have the same sort of information that they're using to pick up that type of activity. Um, but it's more that you're keeping up with patching the antivirus because those updates, signatures, things that, that the antivirus is looking for, those have to be updated on your device on a regular basis. And so making sure that you kind of know where you're landing. If you have a free version of antivirus, you know, what does it support? Does it give you the parental controls? And just kind of understanding what you're getting out of your antivirus solution, how much protection it's giving you, and then making sure that no matter what version that you're running, that you are going through that patching process. All right, so for network security, um, especially when we're working from home, it becomes really important that we use VPN. So VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and the purpose of that is that our information is being encrypted from my house all the way to my to Adasio's office when I'm reaching out to a server that's at their data center. So we want to protect that information. You know, there's a lot of different devices that our emails are traveling through. And so having a VPN connection is going to be really critical in protecting the data that's flowing through networks. And so um, having MFA on your VPN is something that is really important as well. And that means that it's not just my password and my username that gets me access to my company's network, that we do have an additional layer of protection to say, okay, well, I do have to actually have my phone with me and I get a text message or I get a, a push notification that says that, yes, I am actually Cheryl Hearn making the attempt to log into the network. It's a key part of um, VPN access. So for guest networks, um, this is something that we want to be careful on a personal level. Um, sometimes we get guest Wi-Fi spun up in our home environment and, um, you know, we, we put a password on it and we want to make sure that that guest Wi-Fi is different from the Wi-Fi that we use for our, our work activity. So for me personally, I know I have like my home network that I use, and then I also have a guest Wi-Fi. So that if I have family members come over that need, or friends, or you know anybody that needs to come over and use my network, that I can put it on my guest Wi-Fi, and I don't have to worry as much about protecting that password with my guest Wi-Fi. Um, because it's at least segmented from the rest of my internal network. It's also really important that when we think about it from an organizational level, that we have that segmentation between our work Wi-Fi and our guest work Wi-Fi. So, you know, you're a business and you're offering guest Wi-Fi, um, you need to make sure that, that it has some segregation in between because the mixing of that can be um, 
create a lot of risk for the organization. And so we do have a note here about contacting your ISP on how to set that up. So there's, there's a lot of instructions on how to get that going. Um, or, you know, like we said, reaching out to your local IT guru. The last piece here that we want to cover when talking about securing from work from home is confidentiality. Uh, we know a lot of us have our uh, series or Alexas in our homes. These are becoming much more popular and they do record information. And so if you have any type of sensitive information that you're dealing with, you know, if you happen to be an entity that deals with patient health information and you're talking about a particular patient or anything else that would be considered pretty sensitive in nature, um, you may consider turning off that type of service in the area that you're working in while you're working at home just to keep that type of data from being aggregated into um, those types of platforms. And then also, you know, we try to be aware, uh, especially at Adopio, of um, not sharing, you know, confidential client information um, among family or friends. So, you know, if you need to, for whatever reason, if you're on the go and you need to be out and about and you're having a work call or a video conference, or you're at home and you're having that type of call and it needs to be pretty confident um, and it's confidential, then you want to kind of have that awareness. And it's it, we're in a very different environment today than we have been previously. So it's kind of good to just kind of have that check and balance of, um, okay, you know, who is around, who can hear the conversation. All right, I'm gonna pass it to Angel for this next session. Thanks, Carol. Uh, there's uh, two things I wanted to know. Um, one is the antivirus that we were kind of giving recommendations for. Those are for personal. That's not for um, work. There would be a larger set that we would talk about um, for work. It would depend on the size of your company and your specific needs. But uh, we just want to let you know we're trying to help out for your personal use. Um, low cost or free antivirus that you could use at home because your network has to be just as secure in a lot of ways as our as our work network as we work from home as Cheryl mentioned. Also there's this website we'll share with you afterwards if you want to have fun and check your email addresses and others if you want and to see if there's been a comp if you've been part of a public breach uh, from that email address and uh, it's have I been pawn.com. So we'll send that out as well towards the end of this or add it to the comment section for you. It's kind of fun to take a look at it. Mine has definitely been part of Breaches, my personal one. I've had it for so many years. So, I mean, don't panic because it has. We're just kind of, this is another thing where Cheryl had mentioned, are you using your credentials in more than one place? It's a nice call out for you to be paying attention to that as well, okay? So we're gonna talk about this next section is what are the most common email vulnerabilities for my organization? Uh, so let's start out with security awareness, which is, one of the top ways to handle phishing for your for anyone's organization is to first help the employees become more aware of what to look for that would be considered malicious uh, email. And the reason being is they're just actors are getting better and better and not even anymore every year. It's like on a monthly basis. They have learned to adapt. Um, they're compromising, like we'll say, a vendor's account and then emailing you off of the vendor's account uh, with a saying, an here's an attachment. They already know how you are used to seeing the attachments and the naming convention and they're being very similar with that. So nothing really triggers you or an employee in your organization that that's suspicious or you're downloading it or you're really attempting to open it. You know, something's trying to block you and you're working around to try to get that open or it's asking for your credentials for 365 and you go ahead and you enter them. Um, and then you're compromised. Your credentials are compromised or it's attempting to download malware onto your um, laptop, whether it's for ransomware or, you know, it's a banking Trojan. Uh, so it's the idea of security awareness is the idea of let's teach our employees for work and for personal reasons. You know, at home, it helps you as well because you become more aware of what to be looking for. And the idea of know before I come up with this, and this is a really good call out, we need another layer of firewall and it's the human firewall. So it, something can get through all the different security layers that a company puts in place and it gets down to the person. We want to um, inform the, our employees to be able to be uh, more aware. So, and then there's compliance requirements depending on, you know, if NIST, uh, 
ISO, if you're going with uh, a frameworks, you have HIPAA and PCI compliance requirements, as well as um, Sarbanes-Oxley, which I never say that right, but so there's that one. So there was an interesting article um, that our manager had read about a few weeks ago, and it was in the State of the Dark um, web ebook. So I kind of wanted to mention a couple points on that. Is um, information on 267 million Facebook users was sold in Q1 of, of 2020. So just recently for $540, that's it. And then 164 million users records from a dozen major companies were exposed in a single Q1 2020 dump. That was one of the largest dumps ever. Um, and the dump is credentials. So it's a set of credentials. And 53% of organizations have had a data breach caused by third party information theft. So that's not even theft from your own company, that's third party. So I kind of wanted to share that. All right, next slide. Oh, I already skipped that one. Next slide, sorry about that. I was reading my notes off and I didn't paying attention there. So uh, this is a really good infographic on some of the top social media um, email subjects that we're seeing in 2020 that this would possibility for you to be seen within your company. So this would be good slides to share with um, your employees as well in the company or your family. So you have the new voice message, which we've seen for years. Uh, 55th anniversary and free pizza is interesting. So that one's a relatively new one I'd say this year. LinkedIn has definitely been in the top um, for password resets. Um, uh, somebody new, you know, has been added. We've seen a recent breach, something like that. You'll see that Facebook. Um, you see someone has sent you a direct message on Twitter, uh, and then log in for Chrome and Motorola and Moto X. And these are just for your social media ones. We see ones like for FedEx packages been received, or um, we're seeing ones with like you have been billed for so much, you know, for your onto your Capital One card. Please click here to, you know. Um, to uh, if, if you don't agree with it, so you click on the link and it will take you off to log into your Capital One account and then it'll turn around and redirect you afterwards to your Capital One account. So you won't even be aware that that had just happened to you. So I just wanted to kind of show you those key ones. And then next slide. And then this is interesting. Obviously, COVID has changed the flavor this year of everything that's going on. And it is the same with what are the top email subjects that we're seeing that are um, that know before has also been seeing in 2020. So as you can see now, COVID is taking up more than half of our top 10 subjects at this point. So if you're seeing anything, if we could recommend anything, if you're seeing anything with COVID in it, anything discussing COVID or being able to purchase items that are normally hard to find during COVID, uh, be very wary before you click on a link or download the attachment. Um, we definitely recommend that. So password check required immediately, vacation policy update is interesting. Uh, we've seen a lot with businesses saying we have a new um, uh, remote work policy we need you to review or something to that effect. So kind of watch for anything that's like a pattern change due to COVID. Uh, and take a look at it before and check with someone in your IT department before you go ahead and open it if it feels off or suspicious. And then there's that FedEx tracking we were talking about. We always see that that's been year after year. Okay, next slide. So this is, a, these slides will obviously be sharing with you guys afterwards. Um, I used to screenshot, so I'm trying to save you from doing that. If you're trying to go down that path, we'll, we'll have the slides for you. But some of the red flags to look out for, and this will go into details for you to make it interesting, but the, the biggest one that I would call out that we see time after time that I think needs to be brought home is the date. So if you're getting a message that you're reading in the morning that a CEO asked you for gift cards at two o'clock in the morning your time, that's a red flag. You need to be watching at the time that, you're, that the actual email was sent. Um, we find a lot of times that that's happening between the hours of 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. so that you can find quite a bit of the malicious activity during that time. I'm not saying it's all the time, but that's a good call out that if you just look at the time and start paying attention to that, especially when there's an email that has some form of urgency in it, you have some kind of time timeline you have to do it in, um, you know, so we would definitely recommend the, the date. The rest of this is uh, for your reading afterwards, so we'll share that with you. Uh, the slides with you to take a look at.
And that came from know before as well. And know before is what we primarily use for our security awareness training that we do for our employees and for um, our clients as well, just so that you know. Now, email hygiene. So another part of um, tightening up your email security is security awareness, uh, what to look out for for phishing email, is also email hygiene. We've run across the, um, we run across issues where people still had email in their deleted items folder from four to five years ago. So let's say your email is compromised and um, you have your, uh, a doctor's office or a small hospital, so you have HIPAA regulations, and you have no, and the company has no data retention policy for their email. So in your deleted items folder, you still have emails from four or five years ago, and some of them might have um, patient information in it. So you have PHI or PII information in there. So if you have a data retention policy in place, if you're compromised because you don't have multi-factor authentication, so let's say your email is compromised, uh, if we can limit the amount of email that you're storing, that you have accessible from the, that the actor would have um, accessible to them, uh, that's less that you would have as an issue for PHI investigations. So we definitely recommend taking a look at that. Uh, 365, for example, is the deleted item stays there. It currently as a default until you delete it, then it goes into purged. And then purged items is set, I think, as a default for seven days before it leaves purged. So you can set all of your retention. You can say anything that goes into um, employees deleted folder after 30 days is sent to purged, and you define after you know three days and purged is you know removed um, permanently. And if you have compliance requirements that you have to keep the email for a longer period of time, there's a, there's a way that you also are sending that off to audit and then it stays in audit for a certain period of time that the actor couldn't access, but the company administrator could if needed. So that's just one component of it. And then there's an idea of maybe you don't want emails in general to be there after two years. So that it would, it would be, they would be deleted, you know, after a certain period of time. So we highly recommend taking a look at your data retention policy for your email. And that would include um, data retention for your SharePoint, um, for if you have G Suite, any of your cloud documentation as well. Take a look at um, that kind of like maybe you're reviewing what documents are still out there, whether they should be out there. Maybe you're sharing a link globally with um, another client or another vendor or something instead of locally just to that link and maybe you need to look at that link being temporary so you could say that link is only going to be valid for a year as a default so some of the things that you could look at for that uh, also allowing external forwarding of work emails oh sorry i wasn't quite done with that so uh, that one's another one i know 365 i believe is now defaulting to not allowing this so it's the idea of for your company, you might not, you might have set it so that you can't externally forward any work emails. So that would be something we would recommend you taking a look at, or at least alert to that happening to the administrator so that they're aware that that is happening. Uh, also allow employees to install apps or extensions for their email accounts. Uh, we have to be careful of what apps obviously um, have access to, especially if you're um, you have any compliance requirements and then they also have access to it. So some might say they need some app you install for your calendar. This now has access to all of your calendar events. And let's say you have PHI information or your client or patient information in there that you're scheduling something with them. That they would then have access to it. So if they're compromised, then you're, there's a potential for you to be compromised. So that's something to be aware of as well. And then we definitely recommend an email banner notifying employees of incoming email is outside the organization, especially when they're spoofing like a CEO, which we see frequently. So they're pretending to be the CEO of the company or an executive saying, I need these gift cards for, can you please get me five gift cards for $2,000 and, and email me back to this personal address, you know? So that note that that banner will at least warn you that it's not coming from within the organization. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I love stats, so I'm a big fan of it. So here's another uh, interesting quote in the 2019. This is the Verizon data breach investigations report is a report that most people in IT look forward to reading every year when it comes out. It's called the DBIR report. Um, found that 90% of emailed malware is distributed via macros. So now we understand that 
you know, and how to tighten up your security for your company is we understand that you need to have security awareness so that you can create a human firewall within your organization. Uh, we're aware of the idea that we need to, if there was a comp, you know, multi-factor authentications in place, by the way. And um, we understand that we need to look at data retention for how long do we keep certain emails within our um, inbox or our email folders. And then this part is how can we limit the exposure if malware is downloaded? So next slide. What we recommend because of that is if you don't need to use office macros, um, there's cases like for finance that they need it, we, that you would whitelist to allow for that. But for the most part, not just warn, because a lot of people are learning to click on enable content. In fact, actors help you through that and go, oh, you have to click enable content and they'll show you the bar, click here so that we can you know, continue to show you this thing that we need to show you. So uh, we recommend that you disable it permanently. So it's not allowed at all, unless you absolutely have a need for it. In which case, there's, um, we'll send you resources from Microsoft on how you can do that. We, we also wrote up some steps on how you can do that at home. So if you do this at home on your personal computer, you'll have to do it for both Excel, um, PowerPoint, and Word. And we wrote out the steps on how to do it for personal. And then for work, Microsoft has it written out how you could set up this policy to do it. But we definitely recommend some of the bigger global companies are starting to do this now and only whitelist what teams have the ability to have a macros enabled in order to stop this type of malware. Next slide. Uh, yeah, we all came up with this cute one. I have 12 toolbars for many reasons, but uh, <laughs> uh, so it was fun. All right. And then I think Cheryl, we're going to go into cybersecurity. Yep. Yes. So next topic we're going to cover is why your organization needs to think about cybersecurity insurance. So just like, you know, we've been mentioning that we always approach cyber, you know, security in layers. Um, but things will always make it through. It's important to recognize that um, when, when you're thinking about how to protect the organization that um, bad actors have more uh, time and resources to spend on how to get around all of the very expensive solutions that we're trying to put in place. And so um, you have to have a contingency plan in place in case something does happen. And that's where cybersecurity insurance comes into play. Sorry. There we go. So it says there was a 424% increase in new small business cyber breaches just last year. So I, we know that we've seen this a lot on our side and, and working with clients and seeing um, how many cyber events breaches are affecting, you know, organizations that only have 10 people. So, you know, from a technology standpoint, there's a very small footprint there, but um, there's still reward for a bad actor because the, if, if an organization, organization needs a server with a bunch of its proprietary information or its client information or patient information, then likely that organization is gonna be willing to pay uh, ransomware if they don't have the proper backups in place. And so whenever we have a cybersecurity incident, um, you know, there are gonna be a lot of uh, a costs associated with that process. You know, do you have a service provider to help you restore your environment? You know, are you gonna pay an, you know, a forensics firm to come in to make you feel that, uh, that everything has been tied up and that it's not gonna happen again, that we don't have repeat ransomwares in the same, sort of incident. Um, and then you've got to pull in your legal team. And then if you if you have a compliance or regulatory need, then you're going to have to reach out, you know, and go through that process as well. So there's different, um, different resources that you'll have to pull in with a breach counselor, um, and then maybe even potentially PR for any type of media notification. So there's when we have a security incident, there's a lot that goes into it. And we know, um, even local to Arkansas, there have been organizations that have um, that have basically been taken down by these types of events just due to the amount of cost that was in place. So, um, cybersecurity insurance is you know it's kind of newer in the insurance world and the risk world, and so 
Um, there are no conventional insurance policies uh, out there. And so having figuring out what should be in your inside of your insurance policy is going to vary greatly across different providers. And so um, Sorry, that was a statistic on 60% of small businesses that are victims of a cyber attack go um, out of business within six months. So that was another reference that we were making with that, that Arkansas. So this was the slide I was trying to get to, which was talking about all the different things that you want your cyber policy to cover. And so uh, while Angel and I are more on the actual forensics and incident uh, response piece and not necessarily the the experts for insurance, you know, we do have resources at Adopio to help you kind of think about these things, as well as um, other partners that we work with who are experts in this particular area. So for us on, you know, helping protect the client, our focus is usually of just being aware of all of the different elements that can go into an incident so that you're ensuring that your policy is going to help cover you on all of those things and that it's not, you're not going to become one of those in that statistic that uh, goes out of business from a cybersecurity incident. Yes, and so reshopping is really important. This is something that we've learned a lot recently about how making sure that it's reshopped annually because there's a, a lot of variety and it's with it becoming more and more common, um, it's important to continue to come back and to look at it and to see what the providers are offering there. All right. All right, uh, so Thank you very much. I have, we have some resources that uh, we can share with you as well. Uh, after this, so we'll get to Karen. It includes a pass, our password manager recommendations that um, we'll offer you all on a personal level to get you started. Some cyber insurance resources and the data breach calculator is one of those that were interesting. We have some PDFs we'll send you. We have some links to Adopio blogs like how to do the macros like we talked about, uh, work from home, security. Uh, we have uh, some blogs we wrote on that with some more details, the personal antivirus options, which we have in the slide deck as well, and, um, and how, to, uh, the, how to block the macros. We're gonna send you also the uh, PDF of the red flags for know before and what to look for for email. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, please please feel free to hit us up. Also, we wanted to let you know, if interested, you can reach out to Adafio for a free 30-minute consultation um, if we can't answer your questions for you um, during this point in time or you're watching the recording. You see that was excellent. Does anybody have questions if you want to unmute yourself or send something um, through the chat? Looks like there are some chat comments down there. Everybody's being super positive. Well, I was very impressed. A little bit's over my head, but I'm really impressed with um, the content and the speed and um, ability that you had to convey a lot of information in a short amount of time. So um, again, we are going to provide this on our YouTube channel. So um, be looking for that email. There's one person in the group that I don't have his contact information. So if you participated, but you didn't get a confirmation from the Chamber of Commerce, I don't have your email. Um, but I do want to thank Angel and Cheryl for providing this information and for um, teaching us how you can protect a company's digital assets in this growing remote work community. We do also want to thank our sponsors, Cox Communications and Black Hills Energy. And I want to thank all of the participants for joining us during this webinar. And again, we've recorded this, so it will be uploaded to the Chamber YouTube channel um, in a day or two. So we'll send you that link. And meanwhile, do feel free to reach out to Adapio Technologies if you have questions and contact us at the Rogers Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce for all other business related questions or suggestions for other C2C workshops. So thank you, ladies. We appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.